We all love reptiles and different kinds, but I think that there are five that really aren't worth your time, and five that are close substitutes that you've never heard of that are. So today, let's go over the top five waste of time reptiles. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wicked Wicked Reptiles, stick around. So there are a bunch of reasons why you wouldn't want to keep a certain reptile. Maybe it's just they're too expensive for what they are, they're boring, they're dangerous, whatever. And when I say dangerous, I mean like, if you're a silly goose and don't do your due diligence. So let's not get crazy now. But let's just start it off with number five, reticulated pythons. So reticulated pythons, I'm talking about the mainland retex. So if you don't know, uh, reticulated pythons are the longest snakes in the world. On average, they are the longest snake. The longest snake ever measured was a reticulated python, a mainland reticulated python. And these are animals from Southeast Asia. So you find these in places like Indonesia, for example. But there are a bunch of different islands on Indonesia where there are super dwarf reticulated pythons. This is what I'm gonna say is the substitute because a mainland reticulated python that can get over 20 feet isn't a great pet for most people. Most people can't afford to cage that animal. This is a 200 pound animal that's very strong, very powerful. Sure, most of the time will be very placid and because the reticulated pythons will eat for you every single time, usually, most individuals will, but that's not really a great pet for most people, including me. I would probably never, unless I had a zoo or facility, keep a mainland retic. I would, however, for sure, without a question, keep super dwarf reticulated pythons, which I do. I have four of them. I love super dwarf retics. They're amazing because reticulated pythons are very smart. They're very interesting to watch. They're fun to handle. They're gonna eat for you every single time. They come in a bunch of different morphs and even their wild type looks beautiful. And because there's so many localities, a wild type can look drastically different. If you have, say, a Kalatoa, or one of my favorites is the Bali Yellowhead, which you can see right here, almost biting me in the, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I think that it's really interesting to have animals that are a shrunken down version of the bigger animal because it's more manageable for most people. These reticulated pythons, if you put them in a eight by four by four, right, a huge enclosure like the ones you see down here, you would they would have a ball. It would be crazy, it'd be amazing for them, right? But if you keep a 20 foot snake, and I just don't think that an eight by four by four is very big for them. And the reason that I use that example is just because that is kind of the biggest enclosure that you can buy that isn't gonna be totally custom made. So anyway, super dwarf retex are better than mainland retex in my opinion. And by the way, this is all my opinion. Uh, not saying that these animals are useless or you shouldn't get them. In fact, there's a lot of people that will want them because of the reasons that I say most people shouldn't. This list, as my channel, is mostly for the intermediate novice type keepers. This isn't really directed at experts who are gonna put their time and effort and you know their life into these animals. So just keep that in mind. I'm not pooping on any of them. Uh, just try to be realistic. Number four basilisks. Now there are three main species of basilisk, or there might be a few more, but for sure three that I know of off the top of my head. I'm talking about the larger ones because basilisk basiliscus, I believe is how you pronounce it. This is the big one. These are big, powerful animals. They need a lot of room. And because basilisks are these really amazing diurnal, semi-aquatic, semi-arboreal animals, that makes them super interesting, right? And yes, this is the Jesus lizard. This is the lizard that can run on water kind of but this means they need a huge enclosure and most of them are not handleable. In fact, the only time I've ever seen someone handle one, well, it was in the wild, but still just got bit and bled everywhere. And when we found this monstrosity, not monstrosity, most beautiful, elegant dragon I've ever seen in the wild, we were told keep your hands away from its face because if it gets your finger, it's probably taking it with him. So be careful, be careful careful. And any animal that's gonna get two and a half feet, then the tail on top of that, this is a big lizard and it's gonna need a big space. You can't keep this in a 40 gallon, 75 gallon, 120 gallon enclosure. You need something that is like a grow tent or custom made, it needs to have height, it needs to have lots of room for water because in the wild, basilisks are gonna hang out on branches over the water, that's where they sleep. And if they feel a predator, boom, they are gone. So instead, if you want an animal that is semi-arboreal, semi-aquatic, but doesn't really need as crazy of an environment that isn't quite as big or dangerous, 
then I would say a mountain horn dragon. I'll keep it short because I know we just talked about them a couple weeks ago, but mountain horn dragons are much smaller. Now, basilisks are from Central America. Mountain horn dragons are from Asia, places like Thailand, where we found these ones. So you can find these pretty easily. They're really easy to find, but they're harder to find captive bred. So always find a captive bred one, but if you can, there's a few different species. I have Lepidogaster, which is smaller. They're about a foot. There's Capras, which are much more popular, but kind of hard to find. And those ones get uh, almost 18 inches, but still, this is a much smaller animal and much more friendly than a basilisk. And they're super fun, they're cool, they have horns, they have these masks, they're beautiful. You can keep them communally if you do your research. Don't just go throwing them together willy-nilly, but you can co-have them, but you can't with basilisks most of the time. They need running water or moving water, so even a bubbler would work so that it doesn't look still. They need a little bit of height, but because they're so much smaller, you could keep these in say a 36 by 36 by 18 zoom at or something like that, where with a basilisk, you can't. They're just way too big for that type of thing. Anyway, if you want, we'll do a whole care guide on mountain horn dragons. Maybe you do a collab with Daffy's reptiles or something. Let me know in the comments section if you'd like to see that. And uh, let's move on to number three. Number three, oh, let's ruin it with an amphibian, like we always do. I'm talking about fringe leaf frogs. So, uh, Cruzio hyla, and I'm talking mostly about Cruzio hyla craspidopus because this is the more popular, more beautiful one. Uh, I guess it would work with Cruzio hyla sylviae as well. But either way, these are maybe one of the most beautiful tree frogs on the planet. I mean, it's really hard to argue that anything is even close to as beautiful as these when it comes to tree frogs or leaf frogs. So I would say because they are just so fragile, they're prone to prolapses, they're prone to just dying out of nowhere, they're prone to fungal infections, they're just more difficult to keep than basically every other tree frog that is common. And I don't want to say something like a red-eye tree frog as the substitute because they're too small, although red-eye tree frogs are amazing. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give you two options. I think the best option is dumpy tree frogs, otherwise known as white tree frogs or Australian tree frogs, because they're about the same size. They're pretty big. They have a beautiful call. They're interesting. You can co-have them and they're much more easily taken care of. They're almost bulletproof. There's a lot of really cool bulletproof reptiles. I'll send you the comment section one more time. If you want to see bulletproof reptile list. I actually already filmed it, but I could release it if you want to see it. Either way, White's tree frogs are just much easier to care for. I mean, they take almost no effort whatsoever. Temperature and humidity is really easy. I mean, taking care of tree frogs isn't rocket science in the first place, but if you keep it clean and you keep it humid and you don't let it get too hot, generally you're not going to have issues, especially with something as robust as a dumpy tree frog. The thing is, they're gonna eat basically everything, so it's fun to watch them eat insects and crickets, and crickets are insects, Adam Doobie wrote, you know what I'm talking about, right? They'll even eat things like small mice, pinky mice, if you give them the opportunity, and definitely don't cohab them with smaller animals because they will treat them like lunch, so don't do that. But I think they're a much better option because you're not gonna have to go to the vet or find dead frogs most of the time. Let's talk about something a little bit more rare. Number two, viper boas. Now, viper boas are maybe one of the coolest species of boa on the planet. They look super unique, they're short, they're stout, and they are so very fast, but also cantankerous. Now, I'm not gonna say that you can't tame a viper boa. Of course you could, but it's gonna be a lot more rare than what I'm gonna tell you to get instead. Because this two-foot animal is a pistol. They have sharp teeth, they're pretty big for their size, and they're not afraid to bite you, and they're gonna be faster than you by a long shot. These animals generally don't make great captives for handling, and most of the time they're gonna hide in leaf litter, hide in the dirt, they're a terrestrial animal. They're from places like Indonesia, by the way. Instead, a Solomon Island ground boa. Now these are much, well, not much bigger, but a little bit bigger. Three to four feet rather than two to three feet like the viper boa is. And viper boas usually top out closer to two, two and a half feet. But Solomon Island ground boas, they're cheap right now, but they're gonna definitely go up in value. They're really cool. They're easily tamed down. They're easy to breed. They're easy to keep. Sure, they're terrestrial and they're gonna hide a bunch, but they're more beautifully colored and patterned, in my opinion. And if you don't want one of those, I don't know, get a rubber boa. It's very small boa species. Get a rosy boa, another thing really small, and that one's much more easy to find. I just think that viper boas, the cool factor is there. Of course the cool factor is there with viper boas, but also the you're definitely gonna get bit most of the time and they're not that fun to handle because of that and they're squirmy little wormies. 
that is why I would say Viper Boas are not as good for most people as a Solomon Island Ground Boa, Rosy Boa, Rubber Boa, any of these smaller boas. And of course, Solomon Island Ground Boas come from Solomon Islands and Rosy Boas, the US and Canada, do they go up into Canada? I don't know, but Rubber Boas definitely do. So let's move on to number one. Oh, and yeah, I'll address the fact that I have a black eye and look like I got into a fight and lost. Uh, basically, the, the true story is um, Clint's Reptiles and I, uh, we got into a altercation because he was talking about how Emerald Tree Skinks are better than Schneider Skinks, which obviously he's wrong. Okay, I'm obviously just joking. Clint is the nicest human being on the face of the earth. The true story is I was walking past a pond on my way to Tim Hortons. I live up in here in Canada, right? And I was wearing the wrong color and this uh, gang of beavers came and they slapped me in the face with their tails and it was just like this big thing and they stole my money and which smells like maple syrup, so. Number one, plated lizards. I'm talking about giants, Sudans, that family, okay? Here's why. I had a Sudan plated lizard. I liked this animal, Attila was her name. Very cool looking, but she would bite me and scratch me and tail whip me and pee on me. And no amount of love would get her out of this. Now there are some plated lizards that you can tame out, but it takes quite a bit of work. And in general, they're just kind of boring. They, in my opinion, by the way, they like it very hot. They like it very dry. Well, not very dry, but moderately dry. They're terrestrial most of the time. They're gonna hide from you most of the time. They're not gonna wanna be handled most of the time. They're kind of drab looking. They're cool, but not that cool. And certainly, not as cool as a butterfly agama, which is something we've never spoken about on the channel before. Butterfly agamas are amazing. <laughs> like, they're one of the coolest looking and most underrated species on the planet. I think they're gonna shoot up in value once people realize how cool they are. The issue with them is that they're difficult to find captive bred. These guys are from Southeast Asia, so a bunch of different countries there. And there's of course butterfly agamas, giant butterfly agamas. There's a few different species in the genus, but either way, no matter how you look at it, they are much more handleable on average. They're much easier to tame out. They're about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller than a Sudan plated lizard, but they're a little bit beefier as well, especially the males. Cool color and pattern, cute little faces. They're easy to feed, easy to take care of, very similar care to a Sudan plated lizard. Although Sudan plated lizards are from Africa, obviously, right? Sudan. But either way, I just think they're super underrated. I love them. I think they're amazing. And I mean, will I add them to my collection? Maybe. You should hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and the like button and all the stuff that YouTubers are supposed to say. And a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for doing what you do. You get discounts on merch, videos early, you guys get one-on-ones, all that for as little as $1, and that's it. Because I do videos on Mondays and Thursdays, that means I'll see you in the next one.